Back with today is we're going to talk about the Tattvas and the elementals. Uh, the whole universe is elaborated with the ethereal matter Akasha. The ether disarranges itself into seven different modalities. When these modalities condense, they give origin to all that is created. Um, what we're going to discover today is the Tattvas are just different manifestations of energy. And we've already discussed the idea, and it's something that's common in a lot of different schools, that uh, matter doesn't really exist, right? All that exists is really just different types of energy. And that's something that most physicists will agree with as well, that the presence of matter is just an illusion. What we really see is just different forms of energy in action. And that's really what this quote is talking about. The whole universe is basically just different forms of energy. Um, we just give different names to them. Light is a form of energy. Sound is a form of energy. Even uh, you sitting on that chair right now, the reason why you're not falling through that chair is at a molecular level, the molecules of the chair are repelling the molecules of your butt. So you kind of stay separate from each other giving you the sense that the chair is solid and hard, when in fact, if you can go and look at uh, molecules on a molecular level, we know there's more space in a molecule than actual stuff, right? So that's really what we're talking about here. And basically, um, energy in all its diverse forms, the crystallization or, or condensation of energy gives uh, life to all that's created. And really, if you wanted to get technical, you look at it another way and you could call energy, you know, God, God is everywhere, God is everything because God or Allah, whatever you want to call it, the source of all things, is just the ultimate source of all this energy that surrounds us. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's start with the idea of prana. Prana is the cosmic energy. Prana is vibration, electric motion, light, heat, universal magnetism, fire, light. Everywhere we go, we see prana. Prana being almost like the, the, the root of all things. Uh, when we breathe, we're pulling in oxygen and you know carbon dioxide and nitrogen and all this kind of stuff. But the other thing that happens when we breathe is we're drawing in this energy of the universe, this prana which flows into our body. And remember last week, the practice we were working with was a pranayama, right? It was a way to manipulate this prana, a way to manipulate this energy inside our body. So prana is the cosmic energy. If you think of, you know, as an analogy, let's say there's a god, when he exhales, he breathes, he breathes out that prana, which then gives birth, gives existence to everything that's in this manifest universe. Prana is the life that palpates in each atom and in each sun. Prana is the life of the ether. Okay, ether is just a, a different form of energy that we're going to look at. So prana is the life that palpates in each atom. Prana is the universal life force that we see everywhere. What keeps you know atoms together? What keeps the electrons circulating around the nucleus? It's all prana. It's the source of everything. We say you know objects like this blackboard is built out of components like wood and metal and plastic. Wood and metal and plastic is built out of molecules. Molecules are built out of various elements like you know, nitrogen and oxygen and that kind of stuff. Elements are built out of various atoms. What are atoms built out of? Atoms are built out of different types of prana, different types of energy. Prana is transformed into a very divine substance. The name of this substance is Akasha. So what we're looking at, and that's what we're going to see today, is different levels of energy. So we've got prana being transformed into something called Akasha. You may have heard the term Akashic records before. Yes. The Akashic records are it's just a way of looking at this energy. Everything that happens, it happens because of this energy. This energy, you can think of it almost like a piece of magnetic recording tape. And every single event makes an imprint on this energy. And in the Akashic records, it's a way we can go and look at different events in different times of Earth's history. You can kind of think of the Akashic records like the internet of the higher dimensions. The Akasha itself, the energy, becomes like the, the World Wide Web, and the Akashic records is kind of like a way that we can access this infinite source of information. The Akasha is a marvelous substance that fills the entire infinite space and that, when modified, becomes ether. So we're just looking at different types of this energy. We've got prana, we've got ether, and we've got akasha. They're all just energy at different levels of vibration, different condensations, you could think of it. So, so are they all prana? Well, they all come from prana. Prana is the root. You could, like I said, if you think of God being the source of all things, when he exhales, he breathes out the prana, and everything is related to that energy. That energy is the root of basically everything. So at some level or another, if you go back up high enough, everything becomes prana. Everything eventually returns back to God. We're just looking at different crystallizations of the same energy. 
prana becomes the building, or sorry, yeah, prana becomes the building block of everything in creation. From us to the rock to some planet out in the solar system, it's all related to that. Matter does not exist, energy is the only thing that is real. Now this is an interesting statement, I mean, Master Samuel was making statements like this uh, in, in the early 50s, and that's something that, you know, nowadays most physicists um, take for granted, but at the time that was somewhat of a, a controversial thing to say, that in the end matter doesn't exist, energy is the only thing that's real, matter itself is just an illusion created by different forms of energy. And when we talked about the class of transformation of impressions, what we discovered, life was just energy, right? Energy that we register through the senses and then interpreted by the brain. Everything that happens to us comes at us as a stream of various types of energy. Streams of light energy as images, streams of sound energy as sounds. Life to us is just a continual reception of various types of energy. And this is a, a quote, everything comes from ether, everything returns to ether. This is Sir Oliver Lodge, a great British scientist from a, a while back. It is the ether that gives place through diverse modifications of its equilibrium to all the phenomena of the universe, from the impalpable light to the formidable masses of the world. So we looked earlier at this idea of prana. We have prana up here. And then prana crystallizing to a different level basically gives us the ether. Ether, it's just another word of saying energy, right? So prana, the, the, the source of, you know, breath of God, the, the life force behind everything, becomes various forms of energy. You can substitute ether for energy. So everything comes from energy, everything returns to energy, right? And that's the law of conservation of energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, just change in one form to another. That's one of the laws of thermodynamics that uh, we know from the universe. It is energy that gives place to diverse mo modifications of its equilibrium to all the phenomena of the universe. So really, if we substitute ether for energy, it's really the same thing. Now, the tattvas themselves, the tattvas become different modifications of that energy. If we think of ether as white light, we know white light is composed of various colors, right? If we think of ether as the energy, that ether is composed of different types of energy called tattvas. Colors are to light what the tattvas are to the ether. How do you say tattvas? Tattvas. It's a W, but it's pronounced like a V, kind of like in German. Oh, how it is easy. Yeah. Polish too. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And sometimes, if you if you search or find more information on the internet, you'll sometimes see it with a V and not a W as well. Same kind of thing. So ether modified becomes what we call the tattvas. White light, when modified, brings us all the colors of the rainbow. So ether is to the tattvas as white light is to the various colors in the energy spectrum. Tattvas become just different cycles of vibration, different wavelengths of the universal energy, the ether. Because really that's all colors are. It's just light with a different wavelength. Light vibrating in a slightly different way, which gives us a different color. This ether, when it vibrates in a different way, brings us the different tattvas. The different tattvas then are just different cycles of vibration, different rates of vibration, different frequencies or wavelengths of this universal energy, the ether. Why we study the tattvas is what we're going to see today. The different cycles of vibration control and influence many factors of our lives. And that's what we're going to discover today. There's many tattvas active at different points in the day. And these different tattvas, the different frequencies that they produce, exert an influence on our lives. This is going to look like um, are as similar in many levels to almost like astrology, how the planets and the stars influence our lives, but this is happening much more rapidly on a daily basis. To look at astrology, you're talking about sometimes conjunctions which occur over years or in you know, much larger periods of time. We're going to see the tattvas, this is just another one of those external forces acting on us on a daily basis. Remember that as uh, human beings with our ego, um, we don't have control over the ship of our lives. You know, with that small ship tossed about in this large stormy ocean, where the wind and the waves steer where we go. The 
Tantvas become the wind and the waves in many situations. They're another external influence acting on us that exerts all these little different pushes and pulls on our lives. What we're going to do today is we're going to find out what each of these types of vibration are. We're going to find out how to see what point during the day they actually manifest. And we're going to see the different influences they exert. Some of the tattvas help in some situations. Some of the tattvas actually can hinder us in some situations. So they're just another type of influence that's being exerted over our lives. And the more we study about the influences exerting over our lives, the more we learn to work with them, we can make many aspects of our life become easier. When the tattvas condense, they give origin to all that is created. So you basically got the prana, which becomes the ether. The ether splits up into the different tattvas, and the different tattvas give origin to basically all matter. So everything around us being just various combinations of the tattvas. Just like that white light splits into colors, and those colors give form to everything that we see before us. Those various combinations of colors give form to everything that we see before us in this room. It's the same analogy. The white light, the ether becomes the tattvas, the white light becomes the colors, those colors give form to everything that we see. The ether becomes the tattvas, those different rates of vibration give creation to everything that we see around us, everything in our, our physical universe. So is prana another word for spirit? Yeah, you could call it that, absolutely. Yeah, you could call it that, absolutely. Yeah. Same, same concept, same thing. The study of, those, of the various vibrations of ether, the various vibrations of energy, which is what the tatmas are, is something that uh, Master Samuel tells us is indispensable in various aspects of our lives. It's one of those things that is influencing us on a daily basis that we're not really that aware of. Some people get really into astrology and they like to know what kind of astronomical influences are being exerted. But the tattvas are actually on a much shorter cycle, and they're exerting, in some cases, much more influences on us on a daily basis, changing continually throughout the day. Uh, business affairs, love, health, etc., they're all controlled or influenced by the different cosmic vibrations, the different types of energy around us. If we understand how these vibratory laws work, if we understand these different influences, which become the tattvas, then one of the things that he talks about, which is a really interesting point we'll look at today, we're actually able to do not just financially, we're able to improve the quality of our lives by understanding the different influences that act on us. It doesn't have to be, he's using the example here of, uh, of money, but it doesn't have to be just that as well. We can improve our relationships, we can improve the physical health of our body, we can improve the, the situations that we have occurring with, with our business, our home, affairs, that kind of stuff as well. And this is an interesting point because uh, a lot of different schools look at uh, money as a bad thing. And we tend to think, you know, um, in society that money is a you know, root of all evil, right? And in some aspects it can be. And this is an interesting uh, a comment by Master Samael because a lot of schools that um, exist, they see, you know, being comfortable in life is you're doing something wrong. And in some cases poverty is required to enter some schools. And if you, you know, if you're, you're, if you've done well in your life, if you've worked hard and, and supported yourself and your family, there's almost the sense that that was wrong somehow. That you can't be comfortable in life or take care of those around you because that's not considered spiritual. You have to give everything away and be dirt broke and poor because somehow that is a righteous and spiritual fact. One of the things that Master Samuel reminds us is that money in itself, it's not good or bad. It all depends on what we do with it. Remember money that's root, it's just an exchange for work, for effort, for sacrifice that we have made. We make sacrifice for an employer who exchanges that work, that effort, those ideas, that whatever we put in, into something that we can use and trade amongst each other. Uh, many times in our society we get so caught up in the rat race that we forget that money is not the be-all, end-all, but at the same sense, we still have responsibilities. Responsibilities to our family, to our children, and responsibilities to our significant other. We still have responsibility to society to help you know, the race as a whole by contributing to the development of society as a whole. So money itself is not a bad thing. It just depends what we do with money. 
Uh, if we use money for good, then it's good if we're taking care of our, our friends, our family, or helping our neighbors, you know, that kind of thing, then it's a good thing. If we're using money for, you know, doing negative stuff, if we're hoarding it, if we're, you know, buying drugs or, you know, that kind of stuff, then it's something that's negative. One of the things that he says is, you know, uh, on this particular path, having access to resources is not a sin. It's not anything like that. Uh, obtain much money and use it for the good of humanity. No Gnostic students should live in misery. We don't need to intentionally inflict suffering upon ourselves. Remember, every situation that we're in is karmic. If we're enjoying a comfortable lifestyle, that's karma for things that we've done in our past. If some people are, you know, living in poverty, that's karma for things that they've done negative in the past. They haven't, you know, they've had the opportunity to help those around them or perhaps do something positive and they didn't, so now they're paying the repercussions for that. They're receiving that karma. So that's just something to, to remember because there's a lot of schools that the idea that uh, if you're not dirt broke, like there's something wrong with you. You're not spiritual enough. If you have a house and if you, you know you work a good job and if you're planning for your future or whatever or the future of your children or your family, that somehow that's wrong because you, you can't be spiritual then. You have to give it all away. You have to walk around on the streets as a beggar because then you're righteous and you're spiritual. Um, Shouldn't we all be living like Mother Teresa on the streets of Calcutta? <laughs> well, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, Master Samuel was saying stuff like this, but he himself was regularly turning down a, a ton of money. Uh, one of the interesting things he did is uh, he renounced, he publicly renounced all his copyrights for everything that he'd ever said, every video, every book. He said it's free to whoever wants to use it. And if you ever get some of his books, usually that's right inside the cover. There's a quote from him that says, you know, I, for, what is it? I renounce today and will forever continue to renounce uh, all my rights and copyrights and that kind of stuff. And he was regularly turning down sums of money for TV appearances and all kinds of things. He just wasn't, wasn't into that kind of thing. And one more people were asking him is, you know, does this mean money's bad? Is this why you keep turning it down? He said, no, it's just, you know, this is my gift to humanity. I'm giving this knowledge away. Uh, and he was always very careful about um, you shouldn't be profiting off the knowledge because the knowledge doesn't belong to you to sell. The knowledge belongs to everybody. And the knowledge should have, every person should have access to the knowledge regardless of their, their position in life. Um, so that was the only thing that he talked about is, you know, being well off in your life is, is, is not, a, a, not a sin, it's not a negative thing, but um, the work itself is something that we shouldn't be trying to profit from because it's not ours. It's not ours to sell. Now, looking at Akasha, this is the first of the. So put this one down here. This is Akasha. This is the first of the tavas we'll look at. It's the first of the the colors. You can call it that way. And Akasha is uh, a good time for meditation when the tava of Akasha is active. When that vibration of energy is occurring. It's a, a, something that helps us with meditation. It helps us with the internal work. Today we'll talk about, later on, we'll look at each of these in detail. Then I'll show you how to figure out when and where they're active. So we'll look at each of these things in detail. Then I'll show you how to figure out the <coughs> cycle of the tattvas so you can figure out at what point during the day a particular tattva is active. Uh, akasha is a good time for meditation. So while we're in the time of Akasha, we'll find it easier to meditate will find our meditations more successful. Um, if you're looking to do a lot of prayer, Akash is a good time to do that. Just because the vibration, the influence that's being exerted at that point by that energy is one that helps with these activities. That's the positive aspect of Akasha. The negative aspect of Akasha is we shouldn't be scheduling anything related to business or, or, or love during this time because the influence behind Akasha is to not benefit these types of activities. Now, just because you start something in this tadva doesn't mean it's always going to fail. This is just one of many influences, right? What we're looking at is all the different factors that are influencing our lives. We've got various egos. We've got karma and dharma acting on us. We've got the tadvas acting on us. We've got, we'll look at something called the law of the pendulum in a few weeks acting on us. This is just one of many different types. It's not just because that a cog is here, it's guaranteed to fail because there's things like karma that can overwrite this law. There's different levels of laws, okay? So a good time for meditate, a good time for prayer, reflection, you know, internal study and that kind of stuff. 
not a good time to do things related to business. So a kasha is not a good time to get into a business agreement, you know, buy something or sell something or start a business or do something that's important to our business. Also not a time to be uh, uh, working on a romantic side of things or, or, or you know, partner uh, asking somebody on a date, uh, planning a romantic uh, event, that kind of stuff. Because the influence is not to help these types of activities. This tattva causes us to make very serious mistakes. This tattva, because it's good for meditation and reflection, it causes us to not be very aware of what's around us. So consequently, this is a time when we make stupid mistakes because we're not paying attention. Because the influence of this tattva is to direct our senses internally, which is why it really helps for meditation and prayer when we need to shut off the senses and direct things internally. But while we're, say, working with heavy machinery, we don't want to be shutting off the senses and directing things internally. We want to be paying attention to what's going around us. So we have to be careful when this tattva is active. Because of the influence that it has, it makes it hard to focus on the physical world. We end up becoming more contemplative, more meditative, in this particular time, which can make us make mistakes if we're not careful. Okay, so if we're doing some important work, especially things like uh, you know construction or heavy machinery or, or something like that, we should be careful. We should be aware of that influence. You said because it, it makes you helps you to focus on your inner self. Yeah, yeah, almost like there's an influence there to pull away from the material world you see before us and go more internally. And the last thing you want to do if you're, say, driving a forklift is pull away from the material world and focus things internally. So that's the influence that's there. Uh, this is the negative aspect, and this is something else to, to be aware of as well, just because of the nature of this influence. Everything that begins with Akasha will fail. The influence behind Akasha is death, ending. Which is why it's helpful for meditation, because that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to bring the death of the ego. And many aspects of meditation, reflection, and prayer are ch changes that we want to bring to ourselves by the death of the ego. Okay, so tattva, it's basically, it's like, it's like the black tattva. It's like the, the tattva of death. Not necessarily like physical death, but ending. This is something that, that takes things down. This is something that reduces things, that ends things, that stops things. The last thing you want to do in you know, your romantic appointments and business appointments, you don't want them to stop and to end and to, to be broken apart, right? That's the influence of this tattva. Great for meditation because of that, but not for, for things of business and material nature, you know, planning, uh, appointments, um, that kind of stuff. Because the influence here is death. Uh, the influence of, of change, the influence of, of breaking down, the influence of you know falling apart, and that kind of stuff. The next one we'll look at is Vayu. So just another different vibration of that ether, another different color. Everything that is velocity and motion corresponds to Vayu because Vayu is related with the air, the principle of air. Today we'll also look at the four elements, right? Fire, earth, air, and water. The element of air is related to the tattva of Vayu. And when we look at the principle of air itself, air is seen as velocity, motion, things that are fast moving, things that are fleeting, just like the air, just like the wind, things that are kind of light and vaporous in nature. The winds of the earth itself are influenced by what? by Vayu. When Vayu is active, it tends to be windier. Okay? Things like aerial navigation, flying planes, anything that's related to the air is going to be directly influenced by this tattva because the air element itself is a lot more active when this particular tattva is vibrating. So when this particular tattva vibrates, the air elementals themselves are a lot stronger. So one of the interesting things, the interesting observations that happens during Vayu uh, the negative influence that we see exerting is people talking ill about the fellow man. It's kind of petty crimes like lying, stealing, and that kind of stuff are influenced by Vayu. When we talk about you know shooting our mouth off, we're talking ill gossip. That's related to the wind, right? And that's one of the negative influences of this tattva. Things that are uh, you know that are sneaky and you know backhanded and that kind of stuff are influenced by this tattva. That's the negative aspect. 
uh, we tend to see airplane accidents and things related to you know windstorms and stuff like that. They happen a lot in this tattva, and unfortunately, one of the things that also is influenced by the negative aspect of this tattva is suicides. They tend to be stimulated by this particular ether as well. Um, this is the one that you don't want to get married in, obviously, right? Remember, this is light. This is things of a short duration, things that are fleeting. Hopefully your marriage isn't going to be of short duration and, and fleeting. Um, and Gnostics, when they get married, will go to great lengths to not uh, marry during this particular tadva. Wolfgang and Barbara got married at like 8 in the morning or something like that to be, uh, uh, what's the term, to be uh, not uh, impressed wedding party. But they're that particular day they chose and they were trying to avoid this particular vibration so that's what happened on the other hand though as far as a positive influence anything in your life that you want quick and simple they're the things that are influenced positively by this tadva anything that's quick and simple turns out very well in Vayu because that is the influence quick simple and fleeting anything that you want to be uh, complicated and long lasting that's something that's not going to be positive influenced by this tadva so anything of a short duration that you want to do, if you want to quickly you know, run out and get something, or if you have a particular transaction that you want to do, or something related to your business that you don't want to be drawn out and complicated. Are these times of the day that yes. you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and okay. We'll, we'll look at them all in detail, and I'll show you how you, you calculate all these particular okay. times of the day. Because okay. yeah, these things happen at multiple points throughout the day. Do they stay standard each day, or do they move around? Uh, they move around because they're related to the time of the sunrise. So they're shifting a little bit by each day, right? On a much larger scale, depending on what time of year they move quite a bit. Oh, so that's the yeah. yeah. Um, it is good to carry out intellectual works because your mind and the intellect is influenced by the air elementals. So if we need to, if there's something we need to plan, if there's a problem we need to solve, this is a great time to do it because the mind is really active and really fast when this particular energy is vibrating. So if we need to solve, if we have a plan that we want to put together, or if we need to solve a problem or work on something, this is great for that. If we're, you know, coming up, if we're doing something like writing a book or, you know, something like that, it's a good influence. This is, you know, Julian would like to know this one, right? He's mm -hmm. trying to do his PhD, and this is a time that you'd be really inspired, and you'd find that the words and ideas would come a lot easier because that's the influence that's being exerted by this tongue because it's related to the air. And that's also related to your mind as well, because thoughts are seen as very light and vaporous, that kind of thing. The next one we'll look at, so this was the, this was the air principle. This was the death one. The next one is Tejas. The J is pronounced in H, just to make things more complicated. It's not Tejas, it's Tejas. We tend to feel hot during Tejas because this one is the fire principle. When this particular tantra of vibration comes in, it tends to activate or, or uh, what's the word for? The words just start coming today. It's one of those days. A long class of work today. I'm all worded out. It tends to stimulate, that's what I'm looking for. It tends to stimulate the element of fire. So things related to the element of fire are going to be especially active during the time of Tejas. Never argue with anyone in Tejas because the consequences can be saved. You've all heard the term heated argument, right? That's because the fire element is involved within that. It's because the ego's feeding off that energy. If we end up getting in an argument with somebody during Tejas, there's a lot of tendency for that argument to escalate because the, uh, the element of fire, that, you know, those passions are a lot more active in there. So this is if we we're going to confront somebody about something or something of, of that nature, we want to avoid doing that in Tejas because the consequences can be serious because there's a lot of influence there to really escalate that argument, to really bring out that fire, to bring out that passion, that, that argument. Remembering once again that these are just influences. It doesn't mean that if you got an argument with someone with Tejas, it would be a horrendous thing. It's just one of the many different influences. And part of the studies on this path is we're trying to learn all the different things that become the wind and the waves on our little ship as it navigates through life. Things like karma, understanding how that law works, understanding how the egos work, understanding how return and recurrence works, understanding how the tavas work, understanding how things like the law of the pendulum and some other laws we'll look at later on work. So these are just one of the influences. So it doesn't mean that 
everything is going to be related to just the tattvas. There's other influences there as well, obviously. We can use the time of Tejas to work intensely. Because one of the things that we're working on when we're talking about alchemy is our own internal fires, right? The kundalini, the fires of the heart. So working on that aspect of ourselves would be influenced during that particular time. But we find our own internal fires a lot more active as, uh, at this point as well. As far as marriage, that's one of the ones you want to avoid. So you don't want to, don't want to get married in Vayu because you know the influence there is for a quick, fleeting, light, vaporous kind of marriage. You don't want to get a married in Tejas because the influence there is for that the, the argument that uh, you know the, the negative aspect of fire. The most terrible explosions and accidents happen in this period of the Tadva Tejas. You know, big fires and that kind of stuff are instigated by this particular Tadva. Forest fires, fires in homes, um, explosions and things like that tend to be more influenced by this Tadva just because the element of the fire is a lot more active, a lot stronger during this particular Tadva. The next one we'll look at is Prithvi. And Prithvi is the one that's success in life. If you want to succeed in business, do it in Prithvi. So if you have something that you really want to turn out positive, Prithvi is the one that brings a lot of in positive influence in our life, as opposed to, say, Akasha, which is the influence of death. If you want to have good health, if possible, eat and drink in Prithvi. Marriages that are carried out in Prithvi are happy for life. So if you're looking to, to get married or something like that, this is, this is the time to do that, renew your vows, whatever it is you're planning. There's a lot of beneficial influences that are happening in Prithvi. You know, where Akasha was death and destruction and ending and taking down and tearing apart, Prithvi's just the opposite of that. Every party, every lecture, every business, every appointment done in Prithvi, there's an influence there for total success. So in Prithvi is a very positive um, taught that it's something that, that, that brings together many things. It's, a, it's one that's, there's not really a lot of negative aspects to it. It's one that helps with success. Back here. Oh, wait. Prithi is love, it's charity, it's benevolence. So there's a lot of uh, positive aspects of, of Prithi, especially related to relationships and especially related to business, things involving other people. There's a positive influence there to bring people together, to help plans reach completion, as opposed to, say, looking at Akasha or Vayu, depending on what it is that we're doing. The next one is Apis. And Apis is the principle of water, and it is the opposite of Tejas. So let's just get over here. Apis. And this guy is water. Principle of water and is the opposite of Tejas, fire. This tatva is for the marvelous for the purchase of merchandise. So if you're thinking of trying to you know seal a deal on buying a house or a car or a property or investments or something like that, there's a lot of inf positive influence from Apis. Uh, it is also for marvelous for business and you'd be able to learn earn much money if you know how to take advantage of this tatva. Because this is the principle of water, this tadva works with attraction and accumulation. Those are the things that are related to this tadva. This tadva brings things to us. When we think of finances, we want to attract them and accumulate them, right? So because of the way the finances work, mirror the principle of this tadva, we see some positive influences there. So if you're like a lottery type person, um, this is where you would do it. If you're somebody that likes to buy lottery tickets or, you know, or if you're somebody that likes, you know, doing a little bit of gambling, remembering that this is a, a risk of the egos in both of those situations, right? The ego can get a hold of that, and next thing you know, you can uh, be in a very bad situation. Uh, if you're looking for some influence, if you're looking for what most people call luck, luck and, and money, that luck is actually a result of, of the office. It's one of the influences there when you call luck. Luck can be a combination of many things. It can be karmic, right? Because we can have that dharma coming to us, but also luck can be influenced by office as well. <coughs> uh, journeys by water are good in Opus, and rainfalls that begin in Opus tend to be very lengthy and heavy because rain, of course, being the element of water, is influenced by Opus because it is the top principle of water. Um, if we're planning a journey by water, 
you know, something on a boat or something like that, or a cruise, a good time to begin that would be an office as well. As I mentioned, the top of the office works on concentrating and attracting. So things in life that we want to, to, to accumulate and attract towards us, the influence of office is good for that. It doesn't necessarily have to be finance. It's anything that we're trying to do. Akasha is seen as black and its planet is Saturn, which is interesting because Akasha was death, right? Death associated with black, and as far as planets go, Saturn is the one that's associated with, with, with death. Vayu is greenish blue and Mercury is its planet. Um, when we think of Mercury being air, being light, being fast, that's what Mercury was. I think of the god Mercury, which was the god Hermes. And uh, for the Romans, that's what Mercury is seen as. And from a planetary standpoint, you never really see Mercury because it barely skims above the horizon and it's not there for very long. So Mercury is seen as the fastest moving planet. So we see that influence with Vayu. Uh, Tejas is red like fire and its planet is Mars, the one we associate with anger and war and that kind of stuff, right? So you can kind of see those influences. Prithvi is golden yellow, and the sun is its planet, although there is some influence exerted by Jupiter as well, but it's really a, a, a sun, a solar influence. Um, and Prithvi is the one that, because of the solar influence, that was the one to get married in and to do relationships in, and was helpful for uh, people coming together because we've got that positive solar influence there. And Opus is white, and Venus and the moon are its planets. When you think of the moon, you know the moon definitely influences the water, right? Think of tides. And a lot of the uh, ancient cultures would plant crops and water crops depending on the phases of the moon, right? Um, the moon exerts a lot of influence over the fluids on this planet, the fluids in the plants, the fluids in the um, uh, ocean, and even fluids in the human body. The concept of the menstrual cycle of a female comes from the moon is the connection there too, right? All influenced by Apis. Now, there's two other ones that exist, just like we've got one, two, three, four, five tattvas. There's a total of seven, just like we've got this, you know, this seven notes in the musical scale. We see the number seven everywhere. The law of the heptapara partial, right? The law of the seven. The power three create, the law of seven organize. So we find ourselves having seven tattvas. Now, in addition to the regular cycle of five, there's two special ones, adi and samadhi. These are special forces that we only see active at dawn. So these particular rates of vibration only come in around dawn. As far as what they're good for, they're excellent for internal meditation and alchemy. Okay, so working in advanced practices or alchemy, this is the time to do them. And that's something that you look at much later on in, in Second Chain and stuff like that when you start looking at talk, more advanced talks on alchemy. Um, these are forces that really help meditate. One of the best times to meditate, believe it or not, is at dawn. If you can actually, if you're a morning person, you actually can drag your butt out of bed at that time. That's the best time to meditate, as opposed to you know in the afternoon or sometime in the evening. Dawn is really good for meditation, and depending on how much of a morning person you are, <coughs> it also can be good for that as well. Uh, Adi begins 48 minutes before sunrise. <coughs> okay, so whatever time sunrise is, we're running 48 minutes, that's the point that Adi starts to become active. So we don't even, sunrise is when that sun breaks the um, horizon, right? But 48 minutes before that, when the sun's still down here, we start to see this active. Have you ever, you know that time, I don't know if you've ever been up that late, and right before sunrise, sunrise there's kind of like a weird kind of, almost like electricity and everything around you. This is like a weird <coughs> kind of energy just before sunrise. This is what you're actually feeling, those the particular shavas, or tatvas, sorry. Samadhi begins 24 minutes before sunrise. So rewind 48 minutes before sunrise, we've got Adi, and Adi runs from 48 minutes before sunrise to 24, and then from 24 minutes to sunrise is Samadhi. So if the sun, or let's say the sun uh, rose at, I don't know, six o'clock, we looked at 48 minutes before 6 o'clock would be like 5.12, right? So from 5.12 to 5.36. Six. Those are your three stages. So this one here would be Adi. And from here to 6 o'clock would be Samadhi. Okay, so you're looking at two specific points of vibration. 
24 minutes and 48 minutes. But that first one, Adi, mm -hmm. goes actually right through to the next one. No, it trans. Yeah, it, it stops. Yeah, this one transitions into the next one. It doesn't carry through. No. Nope. Okay. No, I, the one they always merge from one to the other. Okay. They always like there's like a transition of Adi into Samadhi, Samadhi into the next one. Okay. Yeah, so they're. they're this one is 48 and this one is 24. When this one begins, that one ends. It's like a, a crossover point. Okay. Okay. This is how you calculate the tabas. This is the, the way that you can figure out when they're occurring at any particular day. The vibration of the tabas, the tabic cycle, begins at the exact point of sunrise, with the exception of the two that we just saw. The only time that Adi and Samadhi activate is the 48 and 24 minute period before sunrise. Once sunrise starts, then the tatvic cycle begins because the sun is the influence. The sun is seen as a source of all energy, right? So the presence of that sun initiates this cycle. Each tatva vibrates for 24 minutes, repeating at two hour intervals. Okay, because there's five of them, and 24 minutes times five gives you a two hour cycle. Okay, so each tatva vibrates for a 24 minute period. The first tantra is Akasha followed by Vayu, Tejas, Prithvi, and Apis. So the order in which we reviewed them is the order in which they occur. That's the cycle they're op operating on. Okay, Akasha, Vayu, Tejas, Prithvi, and Apis, and then starting the cycle again. So this cycle that you see right here, this is a two-hour cycle. It begins with Akasha, transitions to Vayu, Tejas, Prithvi, and Apis, and then begins again at Akasha. Yes? Um, they all vibrate for 24 minutes, repeating every two hours. Mm -hmm. Now, does that include Adi and Samadhi, no. or is Adi and Samadhi just before sunrise? Just before sunrise, from this point on, forget they exist. Okay. Because they don't happen at regular points throughout the day. It's they, just at that time. It's just at sunrise. They kind of run independent from everything else. They're not part of the main cycle. They're just a little deviation from the main cycle that occurs just before sunrise. Okay, they're kind of their own thing. Yeah. So then that would mean that Akasha is right as the sun rises? Yes. Yeah. The second that sun cracks the horizon, that's when that first Atava is put into vibration. It is necessary to determine the exact time of sunrise, which changes each day, right? Depending on the, the time of the year we're at, the sunrise changes and it's altering a couple minutes every day. Um, you can find it in newspapers, you can find it on weather websites, you can you know, look it up anywhere to get an idea of when it's occurring. For example, let's say we find the sun rises at 610. So let's say that tomorrow there's something important I want to do. Perhaps uh, I want to go in and ask uh, the boss for a raise. Perhaps I want to apply for a job. Perhaps there's this uh, a nice young lady that I'd like to ask out on a date, whatever. We're looking at an event in our life that we really want to have uh, some control over the, the outcome of that event. Okay, so let's say that we've got something important we want to do tomorrow, and we'd like to get as many positive influences in line as possible. This is what studying the toddlers is all about. So let's say we look at the, uh, go on the weather network, and we look at the sunrise time tomorrow, and we see the sun rises at 610. And let's say that I wanted to uh, uh, work with, you know, asking for a raise, and let's say it was going to be Prithi, because that's attraction and accumulation. I want to find out what would be the most advantageous time to walk into the boss's office and say, listen, I really want to, you know, I think I deserve a raise, or apply for a job, or, you know, ask out to have this, this girl I've had my eye on. I want to find out when the best time to do that during the day is. We find that the sun rises at 6, 10 a.m., so that tells me that Akasha is going to run from 6.10 to 6.34. Vayu can go from 6.34 to 6.58. I'm just adding 24 minutes each period, right? That tells me that Tejas is 6.58 to 7.22. Then uh, is 7.22 to 7.46. And then Alpas runs from 7.46 to 8.10. So see how it's taken two hours to complete that cycle? Then now all I have to do is I just have to add two to all of these. Right? And that tells me everything that's going to happen for the rest of the day. So if I wanted to do Prithvi, I could say, okay, uh, I've got 722 to 746, 942 to 946, 1142 to 1146, 142 to 146, 322 to 346. I can go through the whole day like that, trying to choose which one of those options lines up the best. Wouldn't it be 922 to 946? Yeah. Yeah, well, you were saying 942. 
Oh, then that's because I, I was totally down. So, okay. Yeah, so 722 Excuse to 746, 922 to 946, 11, 11 to 11, 1 to 1, yeah, yeah. it's okay. going like that, two hours yeah. at a time. So they're all like that. Yep. So they're all quite too. And Alpas is for money, right? No, this the Prithi is the one that we want for money. That's the accumulation and attracting. That's the bringing oh, things so to for us. For lottery is Prithi? Yeah. Oh, okay. Are there any implications to the longer and shorter days of the year? I mean, obviously, you're going to get more cycles in a longer day, but the reality is that you're not always going to have an exact two-hour interval at the end of the day, so you could end not at Apas, uh, you could end at one of the others. Yeah, exactly. And then right before sunrise, you're going to get the two weird ones that happen on their own anyway, the two Adi and Samadhi. So they're the ones that really change where they are because the sunrise, as we know, changes a lot. And remember that, you know, this is irrelevant to daylight savings time or whatever, because it's totally influenced by the time the sun rises. So our interpretation of hours and stuff shifts around that, but the whole cycle is always determined by sunrise. Can this go through through the night, too? Mm -hmm. It can go all the way through the night? Yeah. Just 48 minutes before sunrise, it probably pretty much dies out. Yeah, and we've got Adi and Salati to kick okay. in. This is a bit of an ego question, but what happens um, up north when you have like 24 hours on Oh, yeah. Yeah, or, or 24 hours of darkness. Yeah. Whoa. Huh? That's weird. I have no idea. What would happen not, then? It just occurred. You don't know. You messed them up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've got that constant presence of the sun. I don't know, and that's one of the weird things of, um, of being in that those environments. They do really strange things to humans that live in those environments, That wouldn't right? apply then, would it? The, they're still there, but I don't know, maybe not. The sun is always out. Maybe they're happening on a much, much larger. I wonder if the time is slowing down the closer you get to the top of the pole. Because the closer you get, the longer the sun is, the more they would be stretched out, maybe. And That's an what happens when there's total darkness? I don't know. Be looking months, at that, you know? <laughs> instead of happening in a day, it'd be happening six months and six months. So yep. I wonder if that whole cycle is. The other thing would, that out. would be really weird is travel. Right? Like we went to Hawaii a couple of years ago, so we were up for like 36 hours straight. But you're going through time zones, so you would you'd actually be driving as you're changing your position relative to the sun. You'd actually be traversing through these exact energy fields. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah, now you blow my mind with that kind of North Pole, South Pole. I don't know. That's yeah. a good one. Depression is a problem in the North if you're not when, it's, when the sun is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because you're basically stuck in some of those dark ones. Well, our family was, it was, it went dark in the 10th of December, and it went 1st of December, and it was dark till 10th of January. And of course, further north you go, the longer. The longer that is? Yeah. Wow. See, you know, the, the, the uh, Arctic Circle is the cutoff point. It mm -hmm. never, if you're below the Arctic Circle, it never gets dark. If you start to go above the Arctic Circle, it progressively gets darker. So you have six weeks of darkness. Yeah. Basically. Wow. Well, what my daughter did was put in a, a California ceiling in her kitchen mm -hmm. with uh, a bulb so that she had daylight bulbs. Oh, you can get those full spectrum bulbs. And she put the yeah. whole ceiling in its light. Interesting. Well, they were there 13 years. Oh. oh wow. That would have been an experience. So I don't know what they did about this. <laughs> Um, so these uh, these cycles you said are based on the cycles of the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. um, so which, uh, if Akasha is when the sun rises, is there certain uh, ones that reflect uh, when the sun is highest in the sky and when the sun sets? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. What was opposite again? Uh, that's that's the moon, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's the little one. That's the water. The old water. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the cycle repeats again. So we just throw two hours on top of yeah. all that, etc., etc., etc. Now, when you first see this, there's an inclination. You can go a little bit crazy on this. Uh, I did it for a little while. I think Wolfgang yeah, yeah. did it for a lot longer time I did. Suddenly you try to make everything that you do fit to the schedule. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Let me know how that works out for you. You can almost go crazy. You're like, okay, I'm going to do something. Oh, wait. <laughs> okay, six minutes. 
<laughs> you can almost go crazy. Dude, I made an Excel spreadsheet. You like you punched in the sunrise, and it would like populate everything for the entire day. So like, okay, start my day with sunrise on this day. And okay, and then highlight everything. And ah, forget it. You go crazy. Uh, now, if there's something big that I want to do, if there's something important in my life, uh, you know, buying a house or selling something or buying something or looking for something or an important conversation or you know, something like that, or the ones for meditation are good, definitely. But you go crazy trying to fit your entire life to this particular schedule. Um, I, I did experiment with the uh, with the, the uh, uh, one for the, the gambling. I sat there and waited, and then at the, when the right time came, I fired my $20 bill into a slot machine, and uh, in 16 minutes walked away with $280. <laughs> so there's my little fortune. So you could say I maybe it was just coincidence and it wasn't really the toughest. I don't know. There you go. Um, but yeah, the way I looked at it is, is I said to myself, if I want a whole lot of money here, I'm going to, you know, do something positive with what I get. Or maybe I'm not going to put it in my pocket or, you know, go on a real drunken bender or something. I was going to do something positive with it. Um, <clears throat> remember that you need to know the exact time of sunrise to be guided by the tadvas. It's a good idea to have a watch and try to take advantage of the tadvas in practical life. Meaning that you, you're seeing as a major decision in your life. It's just one more thing to get in line. You know, getting the ducks in line on everything. It's always good to you know try to do a little bit of um, um, self-observation to try to see what egos are behind a particular motor for the event that you're going to do. You might want to you know look at your horoscopes or astrology on a much larger scale. You also want to check what's going on with the toddlers. You want to line up as many positive influences as you can or eliminate as many negative influences as you can to see whatever it is you're trying to do to go to fruition. Uh, any questions about the topics? If you say for instance taking an exam for three hours, mm -hmm. you can go through all those tantrums, can't you? You could. Everyone will influence you all. Yeah, you and the important thing to remember, that was a good question, because some things are going to take more than 24 minutes. It's mm -hmm. what the influences are coming into place, condensing when the event begins. So it's like when you first take that first step, it's the push that's behind you. So if you're looking at something like, uh, you know, going to, uh, I don't know, like a complicated business transaction like selling a house, well, that's going to happen in 24 minutes. That could be days. But it's that push that starts the event. It's important to make sure the push is the right one, a push in the right direction, as opposed to, say, a push in the wrong direction. Because you have many things in life don't happen in a 24-minute cycle. But as that, uh, as that event is coming into crystallization, all those forces are merging to initiate the event. And when you want to make sure the forces merging to initiate the event are the ones that are going to be conducive to it. So presumably, if you, you're going to sell your house, okay, mm -hmm. and you pick a certain time, hopefully the person who's with you is going to go along with you. Because, you know, say for instance it's 9.10 or something yep. like that, and you want to get them there at 9.10, how do the two mesh? <laughs> Um, you know, your, your buyer's here and your real estate person and you're there and you start to, well, 9 is going to be a good time. What happens is these are the people who can't get that night. Oh. You invite them early, offer them a cup of coffee, well, have yeah. a seat, and that, that's the minutes, you've got right. into an earlier time for That's it. what I mean is, is, is you can go crazy trying to do much of this stuff. Think of a wedding, and a wedding doesn't happen in 24 minutes. No. But you could say the beginning of the ceremony happens when that talk comes in. When, when Prithi starts, that's when I want to be walking down the aisle. Because that's what everything's kind of funneling to that point. Vicky, you want to you want to uh, sell your house? Well, when is it you're going to contact the real estate agent and put the listing in? You want everything that's coming oh, together okay, at that yeah. point. Yeah. Look at it that or way. the opposite, if you want to buy a house, would you? Uh, uh, when are you going to when are you going to put your offer in? Oh, when you put your offer yeah. in, you want to put it in there pretty. Yeah, you want to say, okay, this is I really wanted this house here. I'm going to put my offer in. This is the time that I want to go across. This is the influence that I want behind that push. Yeah. yeah, there's so many little things that are going to end in 24 minutes. Yeah, but it's it's the influences that are in place. Because remember, when we think when we think of something, we've created it in the mental plane, and we want to crystallize that action down into the physical. At the point that it's crystallizing into the physical, the influences are in there, basically ingrained into that. Right, just like if you you know you're making something. Um, you know, out of clay, the, everything in the air and whatever is getting into that at the point that it's being molded. You can kind of look at it that way. When an object is, or when an event is being crystallized in the physical, everything that's going into that crystallization, when that idea is transitioning from the mental 
down into the physical. These are the influences that are behind that crystallization. So that's when you want to make sure they're active. Because it's not like you, know, you can get in a discussion and say, we have to stop talking for another two hours, I'll be right back in two hours, and we'll pick up where we left off. Obviously, you can't. But if you're having a discussion with somebody, you have to be aware that if you're you know, at work, if there's a, a meeting, yeah, you could go through that two hours, you could hit all of these. And there'd be points when, yeah, things got heated and then they slowed down and then they got, you know, you can, you're, sometimes you can see these cycles acting. That's why it's another interesting thing, not only to try to plan what you're doing, just trying to be conscious in a day and observe what's going on around you. Try to observe the influence of these things in your environment. What's going on at work or in people at the street or in malls or whatever. Just being conscious of, okay, right now, what's the time? Okay, this such and such topic is going to begin and it has these properties. I'm just trying to, you know, keep an eye out for how those things are being influenced. So we're done with the top of this. Next we'll look at the four elements. The four elements of nature are also condensations of that ether. Okay, so we have the ether that gave us the tantvas, and as we saw, the tantvas related to the, the, the four elements as well. We can look at the elements as being further condensations of the tantvas, energy crystallization on a different level. So when the tantva of, say, apis, which was water, when that crystallized even on a lower level, it gives us the elemental of water, which when that crystallizes even lower, gives us the actual element of water, the actual water that we're familiar with. It's just different levels of crystallization, different condensations of that energy. And that's kind of what the tree of life here shows us. Once again, pointing at it again, we haven't talked about it. It's phase C, but this uh, path that's being traced here is called the ray of creation. And as basically the energy of God descends and condenses through the different dimensions, it gives basically uh, all of creation, everything from the seventh, the sixth, the fifth, the third, the, sorry, the fourth, the first, the third dimension where we are, and even the infra dimensions, the world below us. They're all just different condensations of the energy that comes from the source. And just like you know, God breathing out, that breath condenses and becomes different things. Uh, the first element is ether. You sometimes see this called spirit. Okay. Uh, as far as our body, these elements govern different areas of our body. The element of ether is always, just, we've got fire, earth, air, water, right? But there's always referred to a fifth element. Um, and that's something that's illustrated when we see the, the figure of the pentagram, right? The pentagram has five points, which relates to the five elements as well. Fire, earth, air, water. The fifth one is sometimes called ether, or also called spirit. Sometimes you see it, fire, earth, air, water, and spirit. I thought, the fifth one. I thought ether was energy. Yeah, but then they call one of the elements, one of the manifestations of that energy, ether as well, just to really complicate things. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, call it spirit. You spirit. Might, sp spirit. Yeah. Yeah. To outright it temporarily. Yeah. Because if you look at more of the modern books that are written, um, you'll see fire, earth, air, water, and, and spirit as well. Sometimes you see it even called light fire, earth, air, water, and light. Thing. Uh, as far as our body, the area of our body that we see influenced by the ether is from the top of our head to, to basically between our eyes. Okay, so that area of our body is governed by the element of ether. Um, and why we're looking at the areas of our body is later on today we're going to do a practice that works with the elementals to heal our, our body. And we're going to go through healing these various areas of our body working with these, these elementals. So we'll do that at the end here. Uh, each particular elemental, or each element, is, has a governing body. We, God is such a weird term to use, right? You could call it a deity, you could call it a governing intelligence, you could call it a director, you could call it an organizing principle, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay? In the ancient religions, they were called gods and goddesses, or devas, or angels. You could call the, that the angel, whatever. These are just the intelligence that governs this particular principle. Because everything in this universe that has order has a governor, has some force that's responsible for the allocation of that particular element, you could think of it that way. The name of the divinity or the intelligence behind the ether, behind the spirit or the light, is Sudashiya. The elementals, the 
things responsible for the physical manifestations of this element ether are referred to as puntas. These are the ones you probably haven't heard of. The other elementals you're going to be familiar with. Okay, so this is the governing principle, and you can think of this guy as the boss, these are the workers. Think of it that way. Okay, so the elementals, those are the, the smaller forces, the smaller things that are responsible for the administration, the manifestation of this ether. Okay, at a much larger level, you've got the, the divinity, the deity, the intelligence, Sudashia. The next lower level, you've got the elementals, and then you've got the manifestation. So you could look at it, um, let's just call it a, uh, uh, we could call it like you've got a god, and then you've got the elementals, and then you've got the manifestation. So behind this candle flame, this physical flame you see is the manifestation of the fire elementals. The fire elementals being governed by a separate force that would be seen as the, the god of fire, looking at it that way. Okay, it gets confusing when you start talking about gods because it brings up all the different connotations. And there's a mantra that we can use that activates this particular element, that activates the element of the spirit or the element of ether, and this is the mantra ha, just a ha. Uh. And this is an interesting mantra because when, um, when the Spanish conquistadors came to the Mayans, uh, and they, they asked them what their god was. So the Spanish, they wanted to see, of course, if they were Catholic, because the Spanish were all welcome right here with Catholicism. Uh, they were, you know, what kind of god do you pray to? Who's your god? And, you know, through translator, obviously. Um, the great mind priest just, he did what was known as the great breath, just to ha, a symbol of God breathing everything into existence, sometimes referred to as the great breath. Working with this mantra and working with these elementals on this area of our body, this is what we can do. We can basically help cleanse our mind. We can help improve memory, improve intellect, um, improve consciousness, basically strengthening and enlivening, enlivening our brain. Okay, so if we're working to stimulate these elementals on this area of the body, and we're going to do a big practice night that works all of this in, this is what we can do. So if we have memory problems, um, things you know, might be, I don't know, something like a bad memory or we're trying to remember something or, you know, if we're familiar with somebody that maybe has like a problem like you know, Alzheimer's or something like that, uh, we can work with this particular mantra and these elementals to help heal that area of our body, basically strengthening and enlivening that the brain and that whole mental process. A lovely background, look at this is for air. See, it's for air, right? It's good to see it. I know you didn't even see it coming, did you? Total surprise. Uh, the air elementals govern the area between the eyes to the top of our heart. Now, isn't this interesting? That covers all five senses. Sight is in there, and hearing, and smell, and taste, and that's where my arms are. Touch, right? So that's the area that basically has all five of your senses. The god of the air, or the divinity, or the intelligence, or the governing principle of the air is Ishwara. The elementals of the air are referred to as sylphs and sylphides. I don't know what another name for that is. Fairies. <laughs> right? The classical concept of fairies floating around. Fairies are the air elementals. Yes, when small children would go play in the woods, they would see fairies and gnomes. Fairies and gnomes, not like little guys with hats running around and little women with wings. They were the elementals. Remember, small children have different things active and they're able to see many times into the higher dimensions. A lot of imaginary friends children have are actually intelligences, elementals, in other dimensions. Anybody ever watched kids playing with imaginary friends? Tell me that they're not actually seeing something there. What's really cool is if you put yourself in the right state, you can actually see what they're seeing as well. That's something we lose the ability to do over time as we get older and the ego takes over and the consciousness starts to die is back. That, is that the same thing that animals see then? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Animals themselves are, are related to elemental creatures as well. Animals are a good bridge between pure elemental creatures and where we are, especially things like cats. Things like cats and dogs, they're, you know, they're, they're tied into this for sure. I'm a little confused about what elementals are. Mm -hmm. What are we thinking? 
Like if we looked at, if we looked at the candle flame, right? Yeah. The physical manifestation of this candle flame, yeah. something has to govern, like that's burning, right? Something yeah. has to there's something behind that particular flame. What's behind that is the elementals, the forces which are acting with that fire. Okay, and those forces we call the elementals. The elementals became the fairy tales. They became the mermen and merwomen. They became the gnomes and the dwarves. They became the fairies, and they became the dragons and the salamanders of the fire. That's how they worked their way into, into folklore. A lot of the ancient people were in touch with elementals. Native Americans were very in touch with elementals. They would talk about the spirits in the water, and the spirits in the trees, and the spirits in the rocks. Those spirits were actually the elementals. You can communicate with them, their intelligences, their forces. Um, if you want to work with, uh, um, you know, how did ancient people know what healing properties certain plants have? How did ancient people know to stay away from that plant, but this plant was good for whatever? Because many times the, the shaman, the, 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 the medicine men, what they would do is they'd be able to communicate with the elementals to learn about the properties of the plants. And the elementals would be able to teach them about what the plant did and how that plant would interact so with the human body. elementals like spirits? Yeah. Think of it that way. If you want to think of it like that, yeah, spirits. But remember, a spirit, an angel, a god, a divinity, a whatever, they're just entities. They're in intelligences. Okay? The book I'm reading at the moment is saying the elementals are the second, are the second, the, the, I'm sorry to say division, but it's not division, the second level. Like we're the third dimension, eh? yeah. and the elementals are on the second dimension. Uh, yeah, just, just above us. Actually, this book is just below us. Just below us? Yeah. Mm. That's it goes from second to the third, and then they, you know, fourth and fifth and so on. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The one, but yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Because right now we're actually all, we're three. There's length, right. width, and height in front of us. Yeah. But if you call that three as one whole, then it's a level outside of that. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah, in front of us we see length, width, and height. This is the three-dimensional aspect of that flame. That flame has height, width, and depth. Right. That flame exists three-dimensionally. But the elementals are outside of the three dimensions. They're a level outside of this. Uh, there's a mantra that stimulates the air elementals, and that's the mantra of Ya. And uh, these elementals, working with this mantra, have the ability to improve our senses. So if we had a problem with, say, our hearing or our sight or something like that, we can work with these elementals and this mantra to help heal that part of our body. And like I said, we're going to do a big practice today that goes through all of these, working on our entire body. Guess what that one is? Fireplace channel. Fireplace channel. That's right. Fireplace channel. I feel warm just in here. Yeah. Uh, this is fire. Yep. Uh, didn't see that coming, did you? And a fire. This this region is from the heart to the anus, from the heart to the rectum, and this is where the, all the digestive stuff is. So we see our stomach and our pancreas yeah. and our liver and intestines, all the things because digestion is related to the fire, right? That's like the furnace of your body. That's where everything's broken down and the heat's created right, yeah. and that kind of stuff. So these are related to the digestive fires. The god or the governing principle of fire is the god Rudra. The elementals are the salamanders. They are always dragons, right? Little dragons and things that live in the fire, the salamanders in the fire. Um, salamanders, it sounds funny for us because there's actually lizards named salamanders. Yeah. Why the lizards were called salamanders? The, the salamanders weren't named after the lizards. The lizards were named after the salamanders because it was an early belief. Because you know lizards in the desert lying out in the sun all day, our early people used to think that lizards were like immune to fire. <laughs> and oftentimes, uh, after forest fires and stuff like that, when trees burned down, salamanders would actually inhabit the burned out ruins just because they, whatever the pH of the soil was right for them. So after big fires, they'd go into forests and they'd turn logs over and all these little lizards would skitter out and be like, oh, the lizards, they came from the fire. So they called them salamanders. But uh, dragons are also kind of related to salamanders as well. Uh, as a single, the fire, yeah. Yeah, because there's this connection there. The mantra is uh, everyone's favorite rolling R. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> and if we're looking for working with these elementals in our body, all the organs in this region, this is something we can use to fix them and liven any problems we have on our digestion and stomach and you know, ulcers or something like that, or problems with the intestines or pancreas or something like that. We could um, work with this mantra and these. Uh, 
elementals to help work on that area of our body. What's that? Like? No. Was it Earth? <laughs> no, that's obviously the yeah, water. Uh, that one governs the region from the anus to the knees, which is where our waterworks are, right? Thinking of our waterworks. The excretory areas of the body. There you go. Now, the god is Narayana. The elementals are the undines and the nymphs, which later on became the mermaids and the merpeople. Right? The spirits of the water. Native Americans would talk about the spirits of the rivers, the spirits of the lakes. They were talking about the elementals because we're being, you know, with the third eye active, we can see. That's another interesting uh, side effect, actually. That candle meditation is really interesting because if you meditate on that candle flame long enough, and if you get good enough at it, what actually starts to happen is you start to perceive the elementals of the fire. Once you keep your concentration on that flame, and if you're able to quiet the mind, and activate the higher senses, you'll see the elementals responsible for the, the flame. Same thing with that plant meditation that we do. That's another reason why you can do that. You can meditate on a plant, and if you do that meditation properly with enough concentration and practice, you can actually see the element of the plant and then start to communicate with it, which sounds totally strange. I mean, people talk to plants, and plants respond. You can like, really talk to a plant if you want to. Yes? Um, so what exactly would that look like? Elementals, they often look, it's funny, like little, like little children almost. It's totally bizarre how that sounds. Um, and like I said, speaking of the relationship between humans and plants, that's how a lot of the relationship began, is communicating with the elementals, right? Um, and learning how to use them. And a lot of, uh, what's the term, entheogenic plants, that's how humanity discovered the properties, is working with the elementals. And that's why some plants were used in some cultures to bring about different states of consciousness, things like, you know, uh, mushrooms and peyote and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Which you're literally working with the elementals. They're the ones that are you know, putting you in that state and taking you to those levels. Uh, the mantra is Va. Va. And, oh, wait, get back here. Stop doing And this is one that gives us beauty, cleansing, healing. If you're into trying to eliminate toxins and stuff like that from your body, this is a great one to work with because this is, uh, remember, water is universal solvent. And this is the area that governs our waterworks as well. So helping to excrete or eliminate the toxins from our body or anything like that, we can work with that mantra. Oh, I just drink law. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting practice yeah. too. You can take a bath, uh, you, I, or you can be in a lake or a river, something like that, and you can make a petition to Narayana to help you know cleanse, you know, purify, and enliven your body. You can pronounce the mantra va three times, and then the mantra clean, which would just be clean. It almost sounds like clean, but it's not. It's clean. Uh, and then idea being that you can transfer that stuff into the water. You can you know, cleanse yourself at a, a much different level. It's like a, a spiritual type of cleansing as opposed to like a physical cleansing. So there's a bathtub one for you. One for the ladies with their bubble bath. There you go. Uh, the forest and rocks. Talking about the earth. Uh, the earth is from the knees to the feet, and that's seen as the support, the foundation of the body, but not just the knees, knees to the feet, all the bones and joints as well. The, it's like the earth is the foundation of everything, basically our skeletal system, which becomes the foundation of our body. Sorry, this is kind of awkward to see, isn't it? Uh, the god is Brahma, B-R-A-G-M-A, -A Brahma. And the elementals are the gnomes of the doors, the gnomes and doors of the forest. And children would run off into the forest and they talk about playing with the fairies and the little people. That's what they'd be seeing, that's what they'd be playing with. The mantra is the Ola, Pele. Uh -huh. And the ability, there's an interesting, um, anything that grows in the ground, grains and cereals especially, things that ripen in the sun. They absorb a lot of solar energy, right? They're sitting in the sun all day, they're absorbing the solar energy, they're absorbing a lot of prana. Um, we can, when we're you know, eating grains and cereals, we can mentally pronounce the mantra cream to help extract, they, they call it the chatty. It's this Christic energy. The Christic is just another word for solar. It's not like Jesus is in the wheat, but it's like a solar energy. Um, and that's where something that uh, relates to Christianity, the concept of the mass, the bread in particular, that was another symbol of this. It's actually a solar symbol. Bread is a solar symbol. It's like condensed sunlight. 
basically is what bread is because the grain grows and absorbs the sun and then ripens and then you take that grain, you take all that solar energy and transform it into food. So it wasn't just a piece of, you know, Jesus' body, it wasn't like zombie Jesus you were eating, it was actually an ancient solar symbol. Uh, and that's the particular force that's in there. So when we're eating that kind of stuff, if we're focusing on you know, that solar energy, we can use this mantra to help really pull a lot of that energy out to help our body. Really? Yes. Don't you get a lot more solar energy from eating really dark green vegetables and stuff? Mm -hmm. I don't, it, grain was always a symbol for that. Grain, wheat, and, and uh, barley, and that kind of stuff. Grain sitting in the fields, it was always. You want the grain? Yeah, there you go. It says we want spelt and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's not, I mean, they're not the only things that are obviously plant and all plants absorb solar energy, but for some reason, grain was always the, the symbol of that. Mm -hmm. to the corn being a type of grain, too, right? Uh, the practice we're going to work with tonight is we're going to do a meditation working with the elementals. We'll do a guided meditation, and I'll take you through all of those. Um